Hello, everyone. Good morning. Thank you all for dialing in this morning. We're going to give just a few minutes for everyone to get online. I see we've got a lot of folks trickling in. All right. What a great turnout, everyone. Exciting. Good morning. We're just giving a few minutes to everyone to get started. We have an exciting agenda plan for all of you today. For those of you that are just connecting, my name is Jolyn Vallejo. I'm director of Latin SF. Latin SF is a public-private partnership between the city of San Francisco and the nonprofit Global SF. So I'm still seeing the numbers pop up for participants, so we'll just give it a couple more minutes. Hang tight, grab your coffee, and we'll get started. All right, everyone, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Officially, good morning this Wednesday morning. My name is Jolyn Vallejo, Director of Latin SF. For those of you that have never heard of Latin SF before, we're a public-private initiative created by the San Francisco Mayor's Office and the nonprofit Global SF. We're the gateway for economic development between Latin America, San Francisco, and the rest of the globe for government officials, companies, investors, entrepreneurs, and organizations. Since pretty much 2015, when Latin SF was founded, we've helped over 100 companies with San Francisco or Latin America soft landing, Latin American market penetration, elaboration of go-to-market strategy, workshops and events, and webinars like this one. We've also brought $25.5 million to the city of San Francisco and created numerous jobs. If you want to learn more, you can always go to latinsf.org. Today, I'm very excited because we have a rock star agenda for you. And first and foremost, I'm really excited to be able to introduce to you all Embajador Francisco Santos, who formerly was vice president during the Uribe administration in Colombia between about 2002 to 2010, if I'm correct. And some people know him as also a journalist, and also someone who survived an eight month captivity under Pablo Escobar. He was kidnapped for some time. And so hopefully today he'll be able to share a little bit about that with us. So without further ado, we've got Embajador Santos with us today. We also have the CEO of ProColombia, Ms. Flavia Santoro, who will be joining us in just a bit. But for now, just to get started, before we get into Colombian tech and innovation, I was wondering, Embajador Santos, if you could share with us um, and for our audience what it was like to be under captivity for about eight months. You know, who was the ambassador that went in and then who was the Francisco Santos that came out of that experience? Wow. Do you have a couple of hours? <laughs> um, <laughs> for all of you who are, who, uh, who, uh, and, and, and thank you very much, Olin, for, 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 for hosting this event, which, uh, which is part, and, 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 and it's great to be here with Flavia and with Ricardo, which will probably uh, will, uh, will give you the whole background regarding uh, uh, Colombia tech uh, uh, and why Colombia is so hot uh, regarding uh, uh, app starts, uh, uh, venture capital, etc., which is part of what we want to talk about. But um, Colombia, and, and, and to put part of the discussion in today, I think the resiliency that Colombians learned during the worst 
times of violence are what has made Colombia such a different country today from Latin America. We have survived so many difficult moments, and me particularly because of that kidnapping, and if you want to know about it, uh, you could read uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez's book called Noticia de un Sequestro, or News of the Kidnapping. He wrote about it. And if you want to see a little bit of it, uh, obviously without the context, and many of the things were wrong, but uh, in the first uh, series, uh, in the first uh, season of Narcos, uh, Pablo Escobar kidnaps some journalists in, I, I don't remember what episode, I, I didn't see it. Uh, for one reason, I was going to see it and my, my, my oldest son, which is now 30, said, are you going to see something that is going uh, uh, to show uh, Pablo Escobar, the, the guy who almost uh, left us without uh, uh, a father? And I said, yeah, you're right, I won't see it. But what I know is that this kidnapping of journalists by Pablo Escobar has also, has also been portrayed in that, uh, in that series. Uh, the Francisco Santos is essentially the same. Uh, because the reasons that have that got me kidnapped, which was being a top journalist, somebody who wrote very aggressively about uh, drug trafficking against Pablo Escobar, is the same guy that today thinks that law and order is a very important issue in our countries. If somebody who still fights drug trafficking in any way that it can uh, that it can be fought, if somebody who came out of that kidnapping and created an NGO called País Libre, Free Country, that helped kidnap victims in Colombia and all over Latin America that did big activism in the 90s against the violent groups. And that's one of the reasons why the FARC wanted to kill me in the year 2000. So I had to leave Colombia and, and go working in, 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 in El País of Spain. And it's somebody who has been resilient, but somebody who is, who's part of our history of, of a very violent Colombia that, is, that fortunately is behind us. And, and that resiliency it is what has created this uh, entrepreneur type of uh, mind, resiliency type of mind, the person who finds solutions in the midst of more difficult uh, problems. And, uh, and that's, uh, and that's uh, Francisco Santos. That activism and those, uh, those, uh, that human rights activism, what's a, what was President Uribe uh, called me for to become his, uh, his vice presidential ticket. So, so the kidnapping changed my life, uh, took me in so many different directions. If that hadn't happened to me, I would still be a journalist. Uh, made me, uh, 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 you know, instead of seeing the bullfight from the, from the, from the, uh, Los Toros desde la Barrera, as they say in Colombia, the bullfight from the, from the tribune, I got out into the ring and, and that changed me and that's, uh, and, and, uh, and so uh, I would have never been vice president. I would have never been ambassador if Pablo Escobar hadn't decided to kidnap me in uh, September 19th of 1990. So it changed my life. It didn't change me because uh, I'm still the same human being. I'm the same, the same fighter. I'm, staying, I'm still the, I have appreciated something that I think is very important and is how resilient humanity is and how tough the human body is and how you can adapt. And I'll give you an example. I was held in a very, very small place that obviously was never clean, human, and I'm allergic to everything. I have, you know, all kinds of allergies. I didn't get sick once. So the body adapted to a very tough environment very, very quickly. And it just shows how that adaptability has made us the, what, I, you know, what we are as a human race, which is we're in the top of the food chain. And I think I was able to understand that I'm asthmatic. I didn't get an asthma attack. Living in the perfect environment that doctors say, if you live in that environment, you're going to die. You're going to have a, a, an asthma attack, nothing. So um, it shows that, that, uh, that uh, humans can survive even the worst of circumstances, uh, grow from it, know, you know, uh, learn from it. Obviously, it leaves uh, scars. I, 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 I still have a, a little bit of, a, you would call it PST, uh, or PTSD. Sure. Uh, uh, I hear big noises and I look around what's happening, etc. My driver was killed when I was kidnapped. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, but um, that's what Colombians have suffered for many, many decades. And I'm just uh, uh, a small part of it that, uh, that survived it and that, uh, is here to tell the story, but also to construct a different Colombia 
which is what I've dedicated my life after that kidnapping. Well, thank you so much for your candid response. It's really wonderful to have someone in public service with your trajectory and with your enthusiasm for the country. Um, this is the second time we get an opportunity to speak. So I know that what comes ahead is gonna be very exciting for our speakers and for our attendees. Um, I do wanna say that now that we've sort of gotten into that theme because everyone is sort of asking about it as I was promoting this event, now we can really jump into Colombia and the Colombia that exists today, right? Um, I remember growing up and, and hearing about how dangerous Colombia was, but in my past, you know, five, seven, eight years of travel, um, and specifically in the last four years, Colombia has really, really turned around. And it's amazing to see the innovation, the tech, the level of education that is coming out of the citizens of Colombia. So now let's shift gears into what this webinar is about. We're gonna be talking about technology, links between Colombia and San Francisco. And later on in the webinar, we will be hearing from one of Colombia's success stories top founder, Ricardo Garcia Amaya of VOIQ. So stay tuned, he'll be joining us shortly. But right now, I think what a lot of our audience wants to know is what's happening in Colombia today and what are these links between San Francisco and Colombia? So let's start off and reintroduce Flavia Santoro. She is the president of ProColombia, has an amazing also trajectory of female leader, big career in politics. She is a lawyer and also has a master's degree in insurance law, which is very unique. Um, but I also know that you've led different conferences to encourage leadership in women. Is that correct? Yes. I, I used to work as vice president of a forum uh, place here in Colombia and, and organize some of the leader women uh, forums. Wonderful. And we thank you for that. So for those of you who are not familiar with ProColombia, can you just give us a quick overview of what ProColombia is and what the mission of the organization is? Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, but I would like to start by thanking our ambassador uh, of Colombia in the United States, Mr. Francisco Santos, and thank you for your generosity with your words, mentioning such an experience. It, it really confirms the greatness of, of ambassador that we have. And I would like to thank you, Ms. Jolene Vallejo, Director of Latin SP, Ricardo Garcia Maya, founder of VOIQ, and to everyone that is connected to this event. We really uh, appreciate your interest in, uh, that you are showing in Colombia. We are a unique country that enjoys solid foundations to, to become a regional leader in terms of, of foreign direct investment. Uh, Pro Colombia is the agency that is in charge of promoting Colombia, this great country that uh, leads uh, the investment to come into, into Colombia. And uh, we have several of, of um, solid foundations to, to say that we are the regional leaders in terms of foreign direct investment. They may name a, a few of them, political and economic stability. That's what we have right now. We have a strategic geographic location that's we are very lucky. We have a skilled workforce, talented people that here in, in this country we have a strong innovation ecosystem and we have a dynamic uh, growing economy. We have certainly given the world good reasons to believe in, in, in our country. So for 2021, we are expecting as an agency as ProColombia a rebound uh, uh, for the international um, results of Colombia. So we will expect next year, Colombia will grow 3.7%. Uh, Colombia also enjoys favorable ratings from the three most important rating agencies in the world, S&P, Fitch, and Moody's. Uh, in fact, Moody's confirmed Colombia's VAA2 rating with a stable outlook and a level of investment grade, and that makes our work in ProColombia uh, a great job. We have 22 offices, and one of them is in the United States, and we have, uh, we cover with these offices 33 markets. Um, we are the third largest recipient in Colombia of foreign investment in, in Latin America. And uh, recently, things that help us in our job, we officially became part of the OECD. Uh, so now we are, we are joined uh, Mexico and Chile in this select group of countries. Uh, but also I would like to reinforce the interest and opportunity to invest in Colombia has never been greater. During 2019, with the job of ProColombia, foreign direct investment increased more than 
as compared to 2018. And Colombia has signed and enacted important commercial agreements that enable our country to reach over 1.6 billion consumers. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to invite you to a main event that we have, that is the Colombia Investment Summit, that it will be presential and uh, also virtual, 7, 8, and 9 of, of October. Uh, so that will show you all the opportunities that we have uh, in Colombia uh, to, to let the, the investors know uh, what we do and what are the projects and what are the regions, because we are a country of regions. So I would like you to reinforce that. Please count on for Colombia. We work very connected with the ambassador in the United States. We both, uh, the, um, the embassy uh, in a program that is called Conectados and Pro Colombia, we're always ready to assist any requirements that the investors or anyone will have to, to make sure the projects in Colombia are successful and profitable. And, and that's what we do here in, in Pro Colombia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Flavia. Um, I already see questions trickling into the Q&A box. We are going to hold those to the end, and we promise to get to as many questions as we can. And as a reminder, do submit your questions in the Q&A box, not in the chat box. So just like Flavia mentioned, we, we've heard about the amount of investment going into Colombia. Um, in 2019, Colombian startups raised about $1.3 billion, which is huge. That was a 225% increase from last year, the year before 2018. Now, I know a lot of you are going to be saying, oh, that's because SoftBank invested in Rappi and a big chunk of that goes to Rappi. But if we take Rappi out of this equation, there was still an increase of 75% in investments. So you're going from, you know, 700 million um, in 2019 versus 400 million in 2018. So I'd like to ask Embajador Santos, um, what do you think um, about this and why do you think this happened in such a short period of time, this increase of, of such big investment? Look, I, I think it talks about the quality of our education system that, that, that is producing a, 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 a really good amount of, uh, of technical talent. Uh, let, me, let me give you a... a um, an example or, or, or a history, let me tell you history. Uh, between 2002 and 2010, I was vice president. And one of the things the president really told me is bring investment back to Colombia, please. Nobody wanted to invest in Colombia. 2002, 2003, 2004, they wouldn't even open the door to me. 2005, they'll start coming, 2006. And one of the things that was really incredible was a, a report that the World Bank used to do. Uh, they change it. <clears throat> Those the, the three aspects that I'm uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna write you. They changed that measurement. I think in 2012 or something like that. But Colombia was number one in managerial class in Latin America. We had the best managerial class of all of Latin America. In uh, and, and it was a report called Doing Business. Colombia was number one in technical talent, and that's because we have probably the the best and biggest uh, technical school in Latin America called SENA. It prepares more than 3 million people a year. And, mm -hmm. and, 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 and it adapts and it moves and, 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 and it works very closely with the, with the private uh, sector where you need that, okay, I'll work with you, let's work and see what you need. And the third one was that Colombia had the best climate of investment uh, in the region. And, and, and that goes back to those years that I was telling you at the beginning, you know, uh, where we need to, we needed to be so serious. We need to do well things uh, so that those who came into Colombia did well because we knew that in the end that message would percolate and would move around. And that's what has happened. So in, and in, and in terms of, 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 of new tech, obviously the world is changing so quick. We're moving from a east to west globalization to a north-south globalization that and, and this has just started in the last five years, even, even less maybe. So you're starting, American investors are starting to look in Latin America with different eyes. You have democratic countries and, and, and when they look, they say, wow, what's that country? 50 million people used to have better image. It's, it improved dramatically and look at what's happening. And, and it's in that environment that they start to find unicorns like Rappi, a billion dollars. You can find 
that the biggest, another unicorn from Brazil, but it was created and headed by a Colombian entrepreneur called New Bank. Uh, 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 and they say, wow, there's something different there. And the cities, by the way, started adapting and creating the environment. So you get uh, Medellin with Ruta N, you get Bogota, and you get the national government with Impulsa. So, so you're starting to create an ecosystem that is it's uh, using the advantages that we have, which is knowledge, uh, resiliency, adaptability, capability, quickness, connectivity, uh, uh, and 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 uh, and you start and you start getting uh, the results that we have now. But another element, and, and Ricardo knows about it, is that a lot of the pioneers from Colombia that went to Silicon Valley stayed there and are helping other Colombian companies get into that ecosystem. And I don't know if that works with other countries, but, but a Colombian entrepreneur that wants to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to work uh, in Silicon Valley can get uh, Daniel Bilbao, can work with uh, uh, um, oh, the founder of Platzi, there, and, and they become mentors and, and they help them get into the two biggest or, or, or be prepared to two of the biggest uh, um, companies uh, that, that, that do VC, you know, uh, a Y Combinator and, 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 and five, uh, 500 startups. So, so the, the message is already there. The talent is already there. We need to keep working on it. We need to keep adapting. And one of the reasons or one of the things that we're doing, which, which, which really creates in that environment the, the possibility that this government has decided to provide free education for 100,000 Colombians in English and in coding and that are going to be needed in the next three years. So, so you need to do that permanently. Uh, and, 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 uh, and, and I think uh, part of what has happened is, is just that the solid basis, economic basis and education basis that we had in Colombia were perfect for, for that, uh, su those success stories uh, regarding startups, regarding technology to be part of Colombia, which uh, right now is, I would say the third ecosystem in, uh, in Latin America after Brazil and Mexico uh, is the second in VC. Bogota is the second a uh, a city that attracts VC in, uh, in South America after Sao Paulo. So, so things are happening and, and it's exciting to, to see uh, how local, regional and national governments are working to open their arms to, to, uh, to uh, entrepreneurs, tech entrepreneurs to come and, and develop the uh, the RAPI and many other RAPIs, which uh, which uh, you're going to talk about in the in the um, in, in, in this presentation. That's right. I couldn't agree more, Ambassador Santos. Um, Colombia really just has that magic combination of a scene of great education, of solid policies at the government level to support investment. So on that note, I think everyone has been impacted both emotionally and financially with this pandemic that we're surviving, you know, COVID-19, coronavirus, I think most of us are concerned about what that impact has on Latin America specifically. We've seen the numbers and it's a region that struggles. Um, however, I know that Pro Colombia has been working on a plan to reaccelerate the reactivation of the economy. And I'm wondering, Flavia, if you could share a little bit more about what that plan is and what it might look like, especially you know, during the post-COVID era. Oh, Flavia, I do think you might be on mute. Let's try that again. Yes. I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you. All of us. <laughs> yes, I was telling you that we have been working with uh, very closely with the Minister of Trade Industry and Tourism and with the Vice President in this uh, reactivation plan. Uh, and we are ready to, to uh, reactivate uh, all the business opportunities in Colombia because they have been kept moving forward even during all this uh, uh, pandemic. In, in terms of foreign direct investment during 2020, ProColombia has facilitated the arrival of 116 projects that are expected to generate $6.7 billion uh, in terms of investment and to generate 38,000 new jobs. Uh, furthermore, a couple of months ago, uh, we launched that uh, reactivation plan that I was mentioning that is also under the government strategy 
commitment to Colombia. All this strategy features an incentive plan with very specific measures that will allow Colombia to stand out as a regional leader in terms of attracting those foreign direct investors and as a leading supplier of goods and services for the world. And one of the main goals that this one includes is to attract foreign direct investment that is based on, on three pillars, if you, uh, Jolene, allow me to mention them, is facilitation tools, is near shoring incentives, and is strategic and sectoral and regional measures. Uh, I would like to share with you uh, some specific measures uh, included in the reactivation plan. We, as a country, offer uh, a strategic support for the investors at all stages in the investment cycle through a thoughtfully crafted strategy that we have nicknamed and we have called uh, the red carpet. And this, this red carpet strategy includes comprehensive package of institutional, legal, and financial actions that give us all the necessary tools to offer the investors timely and effective attention. Uh, as you know, as American companies consolidate and diversify the regional supply chains, uh, Colombia will continue to be the ideal nearshoring location, and we're working very hard with the ambassador in this nearshoring strategy. And uh, as I was saying, Colombia has an important commercial agreements that enable us to reach over than 1.6 billion consumers. Uh, our agreements uh, cover 97% of countries in the country, and Colombia is the Latin American uh, country with the best conditions for accessing to the United States, as 96% of Colombian exports enter the United States with 0% tariff. So we already have targeted 600, uh, 616 companies near sharing opportunities worldwide, and we have contacted 433 of them and identified 66 potential investment projects. And uh, we have developed also a one-stop shop with the support of the Inter-American Development Bank. And the purpose of all, all this initiative is to be a single point of institutional contact for all foreign investors who seek to establish their, their uh, investments in Colombia. So that one-stop shop uh, will find value, they will find valuable information, they will make our job easier for the investors and they will make the decisions of them that, uh, to allow them to, to carry out all the procedures, all the processes that are essential for the establishment in our country that will be very helpful. Let me let me add something that's really interesting to the COVID issue that I found while I was uh, in Washington. Uh, 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 I work a lot with universities and uh, MIT. When I'm in the middle of COVID and all that, uh, no, not in the middle of COVID, but 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 COVID can can become an example of it too. In the middle of the migration crisis of uh, Venezuelans to Colombia. They saw that a lot of the Venezuelans were being employed by, by, by this economy, by the aggregate economy, by the economy of the rapids and of the, and they sent a couple of their best investigators to research how this tech economy is, is it creating employment for, and massive employment for, uh, for, uh, for uh, migrants from Venezuela to Colombia, which is something that we're going to see in the future too with COVID, the world changed. We're going to see a world that is more based in this and that, and, and that in that sense, that aggregation economy, that aggregated economy, that aggregated service economy of which San Francisco is probably the, the biggest hub, uh, uh, makes a necessity for all of our countries to be very well linked to, 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 to what uh, new entrepreneurs, venture capital needs and to help uh, Colombian entrepreneurs get, get access to those funds. So. Uh, so, and, and the other thing that I think it's important is that with, with the disruption of the world economy uh, and the dispute between China and the US, which, which is going to, it, it, it's, it's not going away. It's gonna get worse probably. Uh, San Francisco, which was, and, and all of that tech uh, uh, initiative, uh, which used to look to the West uh, for a lot of, uh, of resources, et cetera, uh, is going to have to look south for them because the tech world is splitting and the tech world is becoming more complex. And I think uh, uh, a lot of uh, the um, uh, VC and, and, uh, and companies in, 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 in the area of San Francisco are going to have to look 
with a bigger interest, uh, uh, what opportunities there are for business uh, south of the Rio Grande, from Mexico all the way to Argentina? Yeah, I mean, you've definitely hit the nail on a lot of those issues. You know, we're, we're definitely concerned with some of these political tensions sort of globally arising. Um, but I do think this is a huge opportunity for Latin America to emerge. And on that note, you know, I think all of us look to the World Economic Forum as a global leader, both in thought leadership, in implementation, in research. And one of the things that I feel really excited about is the initiative of machine learning, artificial intelligence, that the World Economic Forum is putting into their center for the fourth industrial revolution. Um, I was very surprised and not surprised at the same time a year and a half ago when the World Economic Forum decided on Colombia, specifically Medellin, for their Spanish-speaking headquarters for the center of the fourth industrial revolution. Um, I'd like to open this question up to both Flavia and Ambassador Santos, even though I think it might be more for Ambassador Santos. Um, why do you think, you know, the World Economic Forum chose Medellin and what's unique about Medellin in this context? I, I would have to go a little bit uh, 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 before why it was settled in Medellin, why in Colombia? And I think the reason is because President Duque has, from his beginnings, been talking about the Fourth Industrial Revolution. He's saying, we need to adapt. We need to change. The economy is changing. We need to go into machine learning. We need to adapt our economy. We need to adapt our, 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 our schooling. We need to, so, and he's been a huge advocate of, uh, of, of that since the beginning. Uh, uh, so so uh, uh, they started looking and saying, wow, this guy is in sync with us. We need to talk to this guy. We need to see what, what, where is he going? And, and he, and obviously uh, uh, in Davos, he pushed very hard to get it into Colombia. And he said, look, this is the right moment, the right place. And, and, and I think it, 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 it has a lot to do with, with President Duque and his initiative and what, what he's been saying and what he's been doing. And all his policies are towards moving our economy to, to an economy that has, that is a, a, an upstart economy, a tech economy, a, an economy that is moving into the 21st century, which by the way, only started five, five months ago. Uh, with COVID, that's when the 21st century started. Uh, uh, and why Medellin? Because Medellin has done a great job and has done its work. Uh, it created Ruta N in, 19, uh, in 2019 or 18. Uh, it, it created uh, a big accelerator, which it, which it really is, financed by, by, by EPM, which is the, the, the biggest, uh, uh, one of the biggest uh, service uh, companies in Colombia public service company in Colombia, very profitable, very well managed, like if it was a private company and, and, and they financed it. And, and so it, it created an ecosystem and, and uh, it was the right, the right place to go. Uh, so, uh, but if you look what's happening in Colombia, you look at Cali. Cali has created uh, a huge tech center too. Uh, you look at Bogota uh, uh, and, and with Impulsa, what, what Bogota is doing, uh, you, you have different ecosystems that are that are being that, that are moving very rapidly. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was speaking with one of the big uh, tech entrepreneurs in Colombia, and he says, uh, uh, "You know what happened to me?" And I said, "No, what? Uh, my uh, my engineers were becoming too expensive, uh, and 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 you know that in this industry, people move very quickly to to, to other companies." And so he started looking at engineers and he started looking at coders in other regions of Colombia. And he said, I'm finding amazing talents. So, so we're just starting this curve. Yeah, Medellin, Bogota, Cali, big epicenters. But you go to Bucaramanga and you're starting to find talent there. You go to the Eje Cafetero, you're starting there. So, so uh, 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 I'm not surprised that, uh, that uh, the fourth uh, uh, industrial revolution center was, uh, was in Medellin. Uh, uh, what is important now is how, as Colombians, are we going to really use that center to make Colombia the, um, the biggest uh, investor and the biggest entrepreneur in artificial intelligence, in, uh, in blockchain, 
in uh, robotics, in everything that the fourth industrial revolution and the center specifically brings, uh, brings to the table. Yeah. yeah. And, and Jolene, I would like to, to compliment the, the ambassador uh, saying that yes, Colombia is becoming that regional leader uh, when it comes to technology and innovation, as well as the ideal de destination for venture capitals too. We, we strive to make Colombia what uh, President Duque is always invited that Colombia will be the Latin American Silicon Valley. And uh, let me share some steps to, to, to support this uh, statement. And uh, first of all, the, the national government is developing a solid public policy to adopt and to diffuse all the digital technologies in Colombia. Uh, in 2019, all the information and communication technology job was published and it's now in force. And this law, what promotes is uh, private investment, legal certainty, and is to develop IT infrastructure. And a couple of years ago also, we have a position of the National Innovation and Digital Transformation Presidential Advisor was created, and that's Victor Munoz, and uh, in order to develop a solid strategy to digitalize our country. So all these achievements of this national initiative, they include the implementation of electronic billing, they include digital medical records, they include telemedicine, they include all these projects such as Colombia Compre Eficiente, uh, which seeks to, to optimize the government procurement system and to, for us to be an example. Actually, Pro Colombia is working also in a transformation, in a digital transformation. Uh, currently, for example, we have over 180 projects and initiatives for digital transformation and that are being deployed in Colombia. Uh, the country is enhancing both its IT infrastructure and uh, procuring a digital framework to ease uh, all the interactions between the citizens and the government because of that uh, leadership of President Duque that the ambassador was mentioning. And we are uh, leveraging all the use of emerging technologies such as cloud computing, uh, the e-commerce is something that we also want to, to to be very strong in it uh, and such uh, as uh, artificial intelligence among others. Uh, so that's what I would like to compliment uh, to ambassadors and That was perfect. I'm just so honored to be here and being moderator of this amazing conversation. At this time, because I see so many great questions in the q and I think we're gonna now invite Ricardo Garcia Amaya to join us, CEO of VOIQ incredible founder and also just success story for Colombia. Hi, Ricardo, thanks for joining us. And I wanna remind everyone and just acknowledge those that are you know, raising hands and wanting to speak. We are jumping a little forward with the agenda and, and starting with Ricardo now so that we can get to your questions. I think the excitement is, is building up and as soon as we're done with the entrepreneurship piece, we're gonna jump into all that Q&A. So continue to put your questions in the box and I'm sorry if I can't take your raised hand at this time. Ricardo, I could spend probably 10 minutes introducing you. You have an amazing uh, trajectory. You know, so proud to see what you've done with the YC alumni group, with Latinx founders. Um, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself because I think you'll do a much better job. <laughs> Thank you, Julian. Thank you very much for inviting me as well. Un placer, Bajor Santos, uh, Flavia, un placer. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a quick uh, background. I was uh, born in New York, but raised in a little town outside Bogota called Cajica. Okay, we, we, we're all familiar with it. <laughs> uh, in, in a farm with my two younger brothers. Uh, my dad work, was an academic and then became the work with the Colombian government. So we move in uh, 94 to New York. Uh, I was 15 when I arrived. My dad kept going with my mom in different appointments from the Colombian government to different countries. And we stayed in, in New York to finish. I finished high school, college, undergrad at NYU. Then I did my MBA uh, at NYU. So we did, you know, we stayed for studies and for the, for, for the rest of the time we've been here. So um, I moved, um, from New York City after my MBA to Silicon Valley uh, with my wife who works at, now at Google. And, um, you know, we went through, uh, my company went through Y Combinator, which is the top technology accelerator investor in the world. Uh, I got the opportunity to have incredible mentors uh, like Michael Siebel, the current uh, president of, of the CEO of Y Combinator. He sold his company for a billion dollars 
to Amazon. I have my two other mentors, media mentors, Red Gary, who sold two companies to Google. And, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Tasser, who sold two companies to Google. Gary, who sold his company to Twitter and eventually now has a, a, a half a billion dollar fund. Uh, all of them in their 30s, right? So that was uh, an incredible experience. And after YC, uh, I raised $5 million and off to the races, uh, building a BOIQ, which uh, uh, creates a platform that basically is robots that sound like humans and can have conversations with you uh, on the phone or over the web. And it's specifically geared towards businesses to talk to their customers and, 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 uh, and prospects, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, you know, VOIQ not only is very innovative and, and tech heavy, but I was reading a lot about your company. And during COVID, I know that VOIQ actually used your artificial intelligence voice bots to help track COVID and worked directly with the government. Could you tell us more about that? Because I think this is something that could be easily adaptable throughout the region in Latin America and possibly here in the U.S. as well. For sure. So um, we immediately when COVID hit, we said, you know, we want to we want to let um, all government organizations, not for profit organizations that want to use our technology uh, in the efforts of fighting COVID to use it at no cost. So we put it out there. Um, we the um, the former ambassador of Colombia to the OEA uh, Embajadora Andres Gonzalez reached out and he's been working really closely with the current Embajador, or the Embajador uh, um, Governor of Cundinamarca, the governor of Cundinamarca in these efforts. And he looked at the platform and said, I can't, um, you know, we can't start soon enough with this. So he, um, we, we started uh, interacting with the governor of Cundinamarca and his team, pretty amazing team that started leveraging AI voice bots to call thousands of Colombians instead of relying on humans, which would take forever, we could, with our technology, we could call the whole country in an hour and get the symptoms and asking for their symptoms and know who has COVID and who doesn't. Um, so that's, that's, that's what uh, we're still running and we're expanding it. Uh, we're starting in Marca and we're starting uh, including more districts. It, you know, the fight of the COVID fight is, is fought in so many fronts when it comes to government. So you have local, state, federal, uh, and so it's, it's the communication between all these entities that that's kind of like the area where they're navigating. But it, we, we've been really happy to be the to be able to um, work with the government of Colombia in, in fighting COVID and, and essentially make Colombia the first country that leverage AI voice bots to diagnose symptoms uh, of, of uh, hundreds of thousands of citizens uh, leveraging this technology, which beats the alternative, which is way too slow, way too human capital intensive. So yeah, it's been an, an incredible, and we've done it obviously as well in, the, in New York and California, but uh, more dear to our heart uh, is working with the Colombian government. Yeah, you know, as a global citizen, I thank you because the lower our cases, the lower the possibility of us quickly getting out of this horrible pandemic and shelter in place. Um, you know, as, as we're talking about this pandemic, and especially the links that we create, you know, globalization is such a beautiful thing at the same time. And the technology transfer that happens between hubs is super important. Um, I want to ask you as a founder, and, and, you know, be as honest as you can. I know Colombia has an amazing tech scene. And, you know, I don't want to underplay any hub in Latin America. But what do you think is important about connecting hubs to, for example, San Francisco or Silicon Valley? Would you say that this is overrated? Um, is this connection important? And I know that you were in New York. Um, why didn't you go back to Columbia? Why did you come to Silicon Valley first? Yeah, yeah, I, I always, um, so I'm as founder of the Y Combinator alumni group with about 3,000 of the top founders in the world with about $100 billion in aggregate valuations, I get a lot of inbound advice on like, hey, have you, um, you, you know, how should I do this? We're looking to navigate Silicon Valley or how do you get into Y Combinator, et cetera. And uh, one of the bigger recommendations that I have is make sure you get, make sure you, the faster you get um, familiar with the Silicon Valley state of mind, the more successful you'll be. And um, I, I always share the fact that I said, look, it's not like I left Kahika 
uh, for Silicon Valley. I left New York City, the capital of the world and one of the funnest cities in the world uh, for Silicon Valley, which is not as fun from a social, <laughs> from, a, from a hanging out perspective. But I left the New York City because the institutional knowledge of product, of founders who have built product companies and venture capital investors have invested in technology goes 60 years back. And these investors who invest in technology build technology companies. There's nothing better for a founder than receive investment from founders of tech companies, not just entrepreneurs. Uh, it, it almost doesn't really matter having an entrepreneur as an investor. It, what really moves the needle is having founders uh, investing in you, tech founders, founders who are familiar building technology product. And the institutional knowledge is why I left New York and I moved to Silicon Valley, 60 years of venture capital and the experience of building tech product. And that's how I mentioned within a year, things happen so fast in Silicon Valley. I mean, I, you know, the, the, the story when I said, you know, moved to Silicon Valley, got into YC, raised 5 million. There's a lot of uh, hard work in between and a lot of challenges. Um, but, you know, it moves really fast if, and um, the doors are way more often than, than in any other industry because venture capitalists do not want to be the, the investors who did not speak to me and I went on to be the rapi, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, in other industries in finance, you don't get to speak to Jamie Dimon, uh, go through that door and speak to Jamie Dimon, JP Morgan Chase, right? Uh, here you get to speak to the top venture capitalists if, you, if you're polished enough, if you have a right story, if you put in your time to learn how to actually have a conversation in Silicon Valley, you can speak with Ben Horowitz, you can speak with Alfred Lin from Sequoia, so yeah, it might take you a year or two to kind of learn the ropes, but you, it's, these doors are not closed. They're wide open and they wanna hear a good um, scalable opportunity. So um, my, my, yeah, my, my advice, I mean, I, I say I drink 100% the Kool-Aid of Silicon Valley. I, I, I advise MBA, MBA um, universities uh, in Europe that come and I've, I've taught several sessions in San Francisco University and on how to pitch to venture capital in Silicon Valley. And one of the things that, one of the underlying pieces of advice that I tell founders from Colombia, founders from Latin America, from, the, from Europe, it's your country is a pilot program. The world is your canvas. If you wanna to come to Silicon Valley and raise Silicon Valley money, your country is a pilot program. You gotta think global, you need to think bigger and bigger. Even when you're in the United States, whatever you're thinking, it's not big enough. When you're in Silicon Valley, it's bigger, right? Uh, I had an amazing conversation with Aaron. Um, he gave me um, he gave me about an hour of his time. A founder of Box, uh, you know, public company of a billion dollar valuation, and it, it's it it really is epitomizes Silicon Valley and why I'm here, why I love it. I sat down with him, you know, and I was talking about BYQ and this and that. He said, "Look, I have no doubt BYQ is a potential billion dollar company, but you really should be thinking how can your company be a ten billion to a hundred billion." If I were to do it again, I should have started with you know ten to hundred billion. Why? Because we're surrounded by three of the companies that are you know have valuations in trillions. So when you have a billion dollar company, you're like the the corner shop, right, in Silicon Valley, and that's the most exciting piece of Silicon Valley. You are surrounded by giants and that 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 know how to do it. So you know, my advice is: look, you don't have to be you know, full, you know, full, you don't have to move here fully if you're a founder, literally just crash on someone's couch for two months just to breathe the air of Silicon Valley, uh, not recently with the fires, but you know, the, the magic of Silicon Valley, conversations that come about here, it just elevates you, right? Um, and you demystify it, right? You can go back and, and you realize that it's a state of mind. You don't have to be here, but you do have to kind of, you don't have to live here, but you do have to be exposed to it to really understand it and speak the language and um, you know, so, so, you know, big uh, Kool-Aid drinker here, Silicon Valley. I advise it to everyone. I'm glad you drank the Kool-Aid. I want to be respectful <laughs> of the questions in the box. We're going to get to them right now. My last question for you, Ricardo, if you could just share with our audience, what was it like for you to fundraise those $5 million, not just from Right C, but, you know, Global Leap or, or Leap, Leap Partners, um, and some other VCs that are here in the Valley? Uh, yeah, so my, the, the market for venture capital and for investment in tech 
it's still not mature uh, in Latin America, but it's growing. And like anything, when you're building a tech startup, you got to be thinking 10, 15 years out. It's not going to, nothing happens in two years, right? Same thing with the, with the landscape of investors in Latin America and Colombia, and, uh, even outside Silicon Valley, right? So most of the country does not know how to invest in tech. So it's not just, uh, you know, not outside the U.S. Um, it takes time in, in, in the investors. I am here in Silicon Valley, so I have the ability to uh, speak the language. When I, when I speak to investors outside of Silicon Valley in Colombia and in Latin America, they see it from a different approach. The, I, I see a lot of hope uh, with, of second, third generation family offices in Latin America uh, that the, 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 their kids study abroad and they, their peers from the top universities are in venture capital and they want to be able to get into venture capital. They get it. So in Latin America, they still invest like New York does until, until the past five years, which is, you know, very much private equity focus, very much like you got to show me the numbers. They don't understand that this is a bet to 10 years out, you know, um, and, and, and the processes are still built for like private equity or like real estate or insurance, which is like New York type of steep speak. So, it, it, there's a huge disconnect. The biggest advantage when I speak to an investor in Colombia or outside Silicon Valley is that I know that they're wrong. That's the key differentiator. When I'm in Colombia and I don't know Silicon Valley investors, then you think that that's, those are your options. So that's another advice that I give Colombians and everything. You don't rely on venture capital in your country. You, if you race from Silicon Valley, you will never have to depend on anybody wherever you come from. And it's great because what Bajador uh, Santos mentioned, from my perspective, the ecosystem is built by founders and, and Bajador Santos said it, um, you know, that they, like, uh, you know, uh, Andres Barreto from Colombia, right? Uh, Freddy from Platzi, uh, Andres, Daniel, Bilbao, right? Like, these, this is how it built. It was built like that in New York. Uh, the government can do many things, but the, all, the best thing that they can do is to help the founders and not even help them at the point that Daniel or me are. We don't need money from Latin America at this point. What, what they need is to have conversations with founders like them that actually know what is it that we need and what is it the next generation of founders need. And that's how you build it. I, was, I worked at the mayor's office in New York City under Michael Bloomberg's third term in developing the technology roadmap in New York City. That administration was at the right place at the right time when you, where technology was taken off. It wasn't New York City uh, office of the mayor or any administration that created the tech hub that exists. It's the flourishing of the ecosystem of founders that are, you know, that came on top of previous founders in New York and made it and it made it what it is now, right? And 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 what you need to do is help support the founders, and that's what drives the ecosystem. Um, not from top down, kind of just, you know, really listen to the founders. Thank you, Ricardo. That's a perfect answer. And just like Silicon Valley and San Francisco, everything here is organic um, and it just flourishes with that support. Um, we're going to dive right into Q&A. I want to remind Ambassador Santos and Flavia and, and Ricardo, if there are questions for you, keep your answers short so that we can get quickly to as many questions as we can. Embajador Santos, um, a question here from Sebastián Narváez. How will the upcoming U.S. presidential election affect economic investment between Colombia and the United States? What will change or remain the same depending on who wins? No, uh, the first thing is that uh, uh, as an ambassador, I can't get involved in, uh, in politics, uh, in presidential politics. And Colombia has always had a bipartisan, a bipartisan policy. So, so, uh, so we work with Republicans, we work with uh, Democrats. Uh, if you look at Plan Colombia, was Clinton, Bush, Obama, and now Trump, and four governments uh, uh, in, uh, in Colombia. What we really need to do is to keep doing what we're doing, maintaining that close relationship, one, opening up the doors to different types of, uh, of, uh, of, of plans that the U.S. can, uh, can, uh, can uh, uh, implement in Colombia, and very, very importantly, look for the entrepreneurs in the U.S. that are looking at uh, Colombia with different eyes now. And my job, you know, I spend 30% uh, of my time in Washington. Uh, uh, and now that I'm, now that I'm in COVID, uh, I, I'm doing uh, seminars with companies uh, day in and day out. This is the job. You have to really bring those companies and you have to really connect people. Uh, uh, that's more important than 
than what happens in, in a presidential election because in the end, presidents come and go. It's the relationship with countries and the conditions that you create, that, 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 that you put forward to benefit both countries, obviously. Okay. Um, earlier, you mentioned a little bit about, you know, New Bank and the success case that, you know, it is a Colombian founder. Um, we have a question here from my very favorite, Laura. Um, she would like to know if there's a more natural connection between Colombia's culture that makes it easier than other Latin American countries to break into Brazil's market, or even more so, you know, for um, Brazil to break into the Colombian market. As a matter of fact, Colombia is very open to, uh, to Brazilian investment. I think the number three, three bank in Colombia is Itaú. Uh, yeah. uh, but doing business in Brazil is very difficult. I have to be very sincere. Brazil loves globalization, but only from Brazil outside. It's very difficult. It has a lot of, of barriers and, and it's very unfortunate. And we should be natural market. We, we're, we, we, we have borders. We're, you know, we're, we're right there. So... Um, so uh, we have to keep working. That is changing. Uh, with, with, with the present administration, uh, Brazil has opened up a lot more. Uh, um, so, um, so, so I think that there's a great opportunity and certainly we should work uh, uh, to get more Brazilian investment to Colombia and more Colombian investment to Brazil. It's the 10th, 12th, 13th economy in the world uh, and it's right next door. So. Uh, so it's obviously that, that, that Colombia has to push very hard for that. Yeah, you know, I, we Latin NSF, we work with Brazil a lot and it's one of the biggest hurdles that San Francisco companies have entering the Brazilian market. It, it's difficult. There's a lot of red tape and you need a local on the ground. It's actually a requirement. Um, I love this question from Greg Stevens. He wrote it in Spanish, and I'm just going to translate as best as I can. He wrote, how can we connect, and this is all, you know, referring to Ruta N, Medellin, and sort of the resources there. He wrote, how can we better connect with Colombian founders, with ProColombia, and really scale those projects to bring more companies um, to Chicago, in this case, or from Chicago to Colombia? Uh, yes. For Colombia, actually, we have uh, developed different activities to raise awareness about our entrepreneurship ecosystem. We have, for example, the Pro Colombia pitch sessions and the reverse pitch sessions. And we are virtually gather a group of uh, Colombian I3 uh, entrepreneurs to, to, for them to showcase the, their projects um, and uh, for them to see what the investors are needing from them uh, so we are ready to assist uh, and to all the companies interested in, in understanding better uh, the investment opportunities in Colombia. Both our teams uh, based in the U.S. and in the Colombian are ready. But I would like also to complement the, the answer of Ambassador regarding Brazil. We have an office in for Colombia in Brazil that actually uh, someone that is very close to the ambassador is ambassador there uh, that he used to be the president of SENA. And we are working very hard to understand that market because it's a huge opportunity for us in investment in tourism and also in exports. There's an office of ProColombia in Chicago, by the way. So, yes. uh, so, uh, so, so they can work. Uh, uh, just go on, uh, on uh, ProColombia Chicago and, and they'll help you connect to the founders in Silicon Valley uh, because we're, we're, we all work together. Uh, um, I just did a conference with, uh, with Jonathan from Platzi, uh, Daniel Bilbao, I work with him very closely. We work very closely with the ecosystem that you have uh, in, uh, in, in San Francisco and we want to promote it as much as possible. There are, they're the best allies, but we also need to look at other markets. Um, you know, Silicon Valley is the Stanford of, uh, of VC. You go to Austin, and, and it's a different tier, but it's, there's also big opportunity. You go to Atlanta and you have VC uh, uh, venture capital for fintech. There are different niches that we need to keep working and, and we work all of them to see uh, where the opportunity presents because it, if, if it's not in Silicon Valley, it can be in Austin, it can be in Chicago, or it can be in Atlanta. And we work with, with all of them to try to accommodate size, perspective, to... Uh, uh, to um, to the, um, the the accelerator or the environment that is more uh, more uh, more um, uh, uh, more in tune with with what the company is obviously 
you want all of them to be in San Francisco, Jolene, I, all of them to sorry. be in Silicon Valley, but, but not all of them are, are, are fit or right to get there at first. Yeah, I forgot something important to mention. My team is in Colombia. My engineers are from La Nacional. My, my CTO and co-founder is from La Nacional. My two younger brothers have venture back companies. So in, in aggregate 12 million raised between my two younger brothers who also have tech startups. We team in New York and Colombia. So our teams are in, in, in and my, my CTO, the CTO of my brother is from Cali. Uh, so, you know, there's some magic here uh, uniting all of these worlds. And, uh, and it's a, you know, it's, a, it's definitely a winning formula. And I get way more founders that are non Latin American asking, how do you do it? How is it done? How do you build a team, you know, in, whether it's in, in Colombia or in Mexico, or which way should we go, blah, blah, blah. So again, it, it kind of also, I only see it from, from this perspective, but I get a lot of inbound, a lot of interest on how do you do that model. And that's the model that, you know, we as Colombians as well want want to see more of, and it's super exciting that it's happening. Thank you. Can we have time for one more question, panelists, or should we close this now? I know we're a little over time. There's so many questions, and I personally promise to get back to each one of you offline. I'm sorry that we can't get to everyone's question. Um, and for those of you raising your hands, we are taking questions from the q and I'm sorry. Um, very quickly, and I think, you know, there's so much going on right now with the ecosystem and, and what's going on. Um, I wonder if both of you, Flavia and Francisco, can speak a little bit to um, this, this idea of government tax incentives for venture capital. Um, there's a question here from an anonymous person. It says, why doesn't the Colombian government offer tax incentives for venture capital investment for tech companies or do something like Startup Chile? We're getting there, and 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 obviously to talk about uh, right now of, uh, of tax incentives in the middle of the fiscal crisis is difficult. But but that's a next that's a logical next step, and and what Chile did was 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 really smart, and 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 uh, they put the, they allowed a lot of VC uh, to come into it, uh, um, uh, with Impulsa we're working in some of that, uh, not at the size that it should be, but 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 we will we will. Uh, we will, we will get, we will get there. I have, I have no doubt about it. It's, it's absolutely necessary. Uh, All yes. Right. Oh, please, Flavia. No, yes, uh, uh, as the ambassador is mentioning, we are working in tax in incentives permanently. That's one of the things that uh, we as a government had since last year with the, with the fiscal reform that we had. So uh, we have a tax incentive, of course, for IT and for software uh, companies. In, and we have something that is very important and that makes us also unique, that it is the Orange Economy Law. So uh, that's uh, something that I would like to, to refer to also. I do remember that, Flavia, because when the president came, I want to say last year, he was mentioning that anyone who opened up an office, especially that was geared towards creative industries, would have a a tax discount and possibly not pay taxes for a few years. Um, I promise to get more information on that and send it out to yeah. everyone who registered. It I is a lot of war. I'm so sorry. I want to personally thank everyone for joining us today. Francisco, Flavia, Ricardo, you've all been wonderful. I want to mention that if you want to learn more about investment in Colombia, Colombia is having its annual investment summit October 7th through 9th. This is really important because there's more than 250 opportunities for you to invest in, 60 of which are 100% tech related. So please go to the website. Um, I'm not sure if it's columbiainvest.co, columbiainvestmentsummit.co, and that's where you can register. It's absolutely free. Again, those dates are 7th and 9th of October. So we hope to see you there as well. And thank you again, Ricardo. Flavia, Embajador Santos, it's been such a pleasure to have you this morning. I wish you the best of luck. Everyone stay healthy and stay safe. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.